Hello everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode in this series on the protostome side of the animal kingdom. This is also the third episode in this mini-series on the arthropods. Today we'll be exploring the creepy, crawly, mostly aquatic world of the crustaceans. This is going to be a particularly interesting episode, because many of the crustaceans that I'm going to mention will likely be novel to you. Lots of these guys are tiny, and they live in the ocean, where the only people who ever see them are the odd fishermen and marine biologists and the like. Many of these crustaceans were certainly novel to me when I started doing the research for this episode. In fact, the research for this episode made me realize that I know almost nothing about the crustaceans, and what I thought I knew was in fact just a small sliver of the salty, crusty totality. Perhaps the most fundamental thing that surprised me was that the crustaceans are not actually a monophyletic clade. I had always thought that there was some ancient ancestral species that emerged hundreds of millions of years ago, having diverged from the ancestors of the myriapods that would then go on to diverge and radiate into the vast array of crustaceans that we know and love today. And it was just that simple. Well, something like this did indeed happen. But there was another major divergence within this sprawling, branching crustacean lineage. That second divergence would produce the hexapods, best known for containing the incomparably diverse clade known as the insects. In other words, the insects, and all the hexapods for that matter, are descendant from the crustaceans. Taxonomically, this means that the crustaceans, as such, are a paraphyletic clade. That's pretty neat. So this entire family tree, including all crustaceans and all hexapods, is known as pancrustacea. In this episode, I'll be exploring all of the cousin branches within pancrustacea, except for the hexapods. We'll save that for the subject of the next episode. For now, we're going to start with the most basal crustaceans, and work our way up to the more recently emerged lineages. The most recent groups also happen to be the most charismatic and easily identifiable crustaceans, like crabs and lobsters. Another surprising thing that I learned while doing the research for this episode was that the crustacean family tree, this unique phylogeny of crusty arthropods, is not nearly as well understood as I first assumed. With the advent of molecular and genetic analysis in the early 2000s, the earlier phylogeny was thrown into doubt and heavily restructured. That earlier phylogeny was built mostly on gross morphological analysis, morphological studies. And today, there's, there's a pretty consistent crustacean phylogeny that's been mapped out thanks to numerous comparative studies on not necessarily gross morphology, but ribosomal genes, protein coding genes, and more subtle morphological features like neural cell development and the structure of the eyes. All of this genetic and morphological research has established a crustacean subphylum with several major classes. Some of the more basal classes include the Ostracoda, the Branchiura, and the Mystacocarida. Some of the more derived classes, although not by much, are the Remipedia, the Cephalocarida, and the Branchiopoda. There are several other important clades packed in between, including one of the largest and most well-known crustacean classes, the Malacostraca. All right, so now that we've laid out the path ahead, let's get started. We'll begin this exploration with the basal crustacean class known as the Ostracoda. This class includes some 70,000 species, but in the modern day, all but 13,000 of them, so the vast majority, have gone extinct. And for the sake of brevity, I'm really only going to take a deep look at some of these clades, some of these genera and species and stuff that are currently alive. There's too many extinct things to really cover them in any comprehensive detail. Furthermore, all of these ostracoda are all very small creatures, with a flat body shaped like an oblong coin. Their face is mounted along the front edge of this coin, from which protrudes a number of appendages, like multiple antenna, mandibles, and worm-like or primitive leg-like structures. These small, humble creatures typically live in or on the seafloor, or as part of a community of zooplankton, and a sizable minority of them are terrestrial, living in moist tropical soils. They include among their ranks carnivores, detrivores, and herbivores, and they're preyed upon by a vast array of larger animals, making them an integral part of the base of the food web. 
Now within the class Ostracoda, there's two major subclasses, and each of them contains two orders. The first subclass is the Myotocopa, containing the Halocypridae and the Myotocopida orders. These can be distinguished from each other due to the fact that the Myotocopida have a seventh worm-like appendage and darkly colored compound eyes mounted along their broad lateral surface. The species in the other order, the Halocypridae, do not have these lateral eyes, and they don't have a seventh, or in some species, even a sixth appendage. Now the other subclass within Ostracoda is the Podocopa. Now these are distinguished from the Myotocopa by their significantly longer second antenna, and the highly diverse morphology of their seventh limb. The Podocopa subclass contains the relatively meager Platocopida order, which contains just six genera, and the Podocopida order, which is actually the most biodiverse order of all Ostracoda. Another very basal clade, closely related to the Ostracodes, are the Branchiura. These are ectoparasites of fish and other aquatic animals, which means that they latch onto their body, penetrate their flesh, and then feed off of their scales and epidermis, or mucus, or blood, or whatever nutrient-rich goop is on the inside. In terms of the Brinkiurin body form, they tend to be oval-shaped, with a rounded carapace hiding a set of legs and various feeding parts like mandibles or suction cups. Brinkiura is a subclass that contains four extant orders, Arguloida, Conopeltis, Dipteropeltis, and Dolops. The Arguloida order, also known as the fish lice, contains a single decently sized family, called Argulidae, and pretty much all of the species here are ectoparasites that live in tropical and subtropical biomes. Their antennae have evolved into hook structures that allow them to cling on to their host, making them quite difficult to remove. The order Dipteropeltis, on the other hand, contains a single species, Dipteropeltis hirundo, which is a cryptic fish louse that parasitizes a variety of South American fish including the infamous piranha. Closely related to the Ostracoda and the Branchiura are the Mystacocarida. This is a poorly understood and cryptic group. They remind me of those tiny, easily overlooked myriapods called the Symphylans and the Parapods. These tiny, pale, blind myriapods live in the void spaces in the soil, where they help break down plant detritus. The mystacocarids are kind of like the aquatic crustacean version of this. They're small, pale crustaceans with multiple appendages protruding from their head. These head appendages are covered in bristles and hairs to catch food particles. Oddly, their actual legs, the limbs coming off the thorax, are small and virtually useless. Their bodies are less than a millimeter in length from head to tip of their tail, and they can be found squirming between the sand grains of beaches and intertidal zones around the world. Now let's bounce around a bit and take a look at the Remipedia. These are really strange, obscure, and enigmatic millipede-like aquatic crustaceans. They have elongated worm-like bodies that are heavily segmented, and from each segment branches a pair of stubby appendages for swimming. As the Remipedia live their lives in the darkness of saltwater aquifers, they are pale and blind, but their sense of smell is actually quite sophisticated. The Remipedia are particularly curious for several reasons. Most badass, in my opinion, is that they're the only venomous crustaceans. They have little fangs that inject a combination of venom and digestive enzymes into their prey to simultaneously shut down their organs and initiate the chemical breakdown of their prey from the inside out. Another neat fact about the Romopedia is that recent chemical, genetic, neurobiological, and developmental studies have placed them as the nearest crustacean relatives to the insects and the other hexapods. Again, this came as somewhat of a surprise, especially for a lot of the scientists who originally, decades and decades ago, thought that the Romopedia were the most basal crustaceans more closely related to the myriapods. Now, despite being a major clade within Crustacea, the Remipedia class itself is small and lacking in biodiversity. 
there's only one extant order, Nectiopoda, and this contains only eight families and twelve genera, with a grand total of 28 species. Due to their cryptic nature, these Remopedia species are generally poorly understood. There isn't much literature on them at all, and I had a really hard time digging up information on them outside of these broad stroke basics. Another basal class of crustacean is the Cephalocarida, or the horseshoe shrimps, which are closely related to and remarkably similar morphologically to the Remopedia, except they have slightly different habitats. Where the Remopedia are deep water organisms, the Cephalocarida tend to live on the seafloor from the intertidal zone off the coast down to a depth of about a kilometer and a half, where there's enough plant and animal detritus falling down from the shallower water habitats for them to feast forever. Also like the Romopedia, the Cephalocarida are quite devoid of biodiversity. They have a single order, Brachypoda, which contains a single family, Hutchinsonielidae, and within this single family, there's only five genera and just 12 species. And all of them are blind, ruddy-colored, worm-like detrivores that burrow in the silt and sediment and mud along the ocean floor. These include, for example, the Filtoniella ilangata, which can be found in the coastal waters around New Zealand, the Lydiella magdalenina, which can be found in the Mediterranean, and the Sandersiella acuminati, which can be found in the northwestern Pacific around Japan. The fourth major class of crustacean, also pretty basal, is the Branchiopoda, or the fairy shrimp. These are also similar to the previous two classes, except they live primarily in freshwater instead of saltwater, and they're a bit less worm-like, with a body plan that's more akin to an elongated horseshoe crab. If you were to line them up, you could almost see the progression from worm-like Romopedia to horseshoe-headed Cephalocarida to the stubbier Branchiopoda. These really do look like tiny horseshoe crabs. Along their backs, they have a smooth, thumb-shaped carapace, followed by a spiny, tapering tail segment. Some defining characteristics of the Branchiopoda include their large, segmented antenna used for locomotion, and in males, also for securing the female during mating. And they also have the presence of gills on their legs and their mouthparts. The first clade of Branchiopods to emerge were the Anastraca, which has since diverged into eight families, with about 300 species. The Anastraca live in freshwater lakes across the world, from deserts to mountains to the polar ice caps. Oddly, they don't exist in saltwater oceans, but there are some species that live in hypersaline lakes, like the Dead Sea. So of all the marine habitats that they inhabit, they can tolerate a wide range of salinities, but they don't seem to prefer or live in the more intermediate salinity of the ocean. Their ability to colonize such a diverse range of habitats comes in no small part due to their ability to enter a state of dormancy, where their metabolism and their growth come to a complete halt. The Anastraca are a very biodiverse group, but not nearly as much so as the Cladocera, or the water fleas, which boasts no less than 650 species. The Cladocera is another one of these groups of branchiopods, and they live in freshwater, but they also include a small handful of species that are the only branchiopods known to colonize the oceans. Now among these Cladoceran suborders are the Tenopoda, with three families, the Onycopoda, also with three families, who are all generally found in the Caspian Sea, Aral Sea, Black Sea region, and the tiny Haplopoda, which contains just a single family, Leptodoridae, a single genus, Leptopora, and just two species, one found in the lakes of North America and the other in lakes of Russia. The last suborder in Cladocera is the Animapoda, which has six families, one of which is called the Daphneidae, with species like Daphnia magna, which are these really tiny, like, little model organisms that I've used personally in my undergraduate research. And if any of you have gone through an undergraduate biology program, there's probably a pretty good chance that in one of your labs, you did something with Daphnia magna. They look like little water balloons with little needle tails and creepy, fluffy mandibles. 
Under a microscope, you can see right through them, so all of their organs and eggs and whatnot are clearly visible. As gross and as weird as they are, they're honestly kind of cute. I liked watching them swim around, nipping at food particles, and just living their little crustacean lives. In contrast to the biodiverse Anastraca and Cladicera, a branchiopoda clade with relatively poor biodiversity is the Nodostraca, or the tadpole shrimp, or the shield shrimp, due to their relatively broad, thumb-shaped body profile. The Nodostraca order has a single family, Triopsidae, and two genera, Lepidurus and Triops. The Triops genus is, in particular, really weird. These shrimp have two nearly fused compound eyes protruding from the top of their head, with a smaller third eye protruding near the center. They basically have a soft, shiny blob of eyeballs sticking up out of the front of their carapace. Yet another branchiopod order is the Conchostraca, or the clam shrimp, which are named after their two-shelled carapace, which can be closed tightly together, like a clam. Now, originally, this group of organisms, under the name Conchostraca, was believed to be monophyletic. It was all believed to be just one simple group. However, thanks to more recent genomic analysis, this Conchostraca group has been found to be paraphyletic, and it has since been split up into three orders, the Spinocotta, the Levocotta, and the Cyclostherida. Okay, so let's pause for a second to regroup and review what we've covered so far. The Ostracoda, the Branchiura, and the Mystacocarida are all smaller, simpler crustaceans, that contribute to either the zooplankton or coastal microfaunal food webs, and together they all form the basis of the larger aquatic ecosystem. These are among the tiniest and most basic primary consumers that feed and support all the populations of all of the larger carnivores, larger predators above them in the food web. Now, all three of these are basal clades. They're descendants from divergence events in the early Cambrian. On the other hand, the Remipedia, the Branchiopoda, and the Cephalocarida are also relatively small and simple, but they're the descendants of younger lineages, which diverged in the twilight years of the Cambrian. Their relative primitiveness suggests that crustacean common ancestors throughout the Cambrian were also probably primitive, and a lot of the more sophisticated evolution that we've seen in groups like the lobsters and the crabs are the result of much later evolutionary processes that shaped these lineages over the hundreds of millions of years after the Cambrian. Speaking of crabs and lobsters, these belong to an intermediate branch that diverged in the middle of the Cambrian, between the emergence of the earlier ostracods and relatives and the emergence of the later Remipedia and their relatives. Now, this intermediate group would quickly split into three major branches, the copepods, the thecostracans, and the malacostracans. Let's start with the copepods, which are a massive group containing 10 orders and some 13,000 highly diverse species. Collectively, they fill many ecological niches. A lot of them are fish parasites but many more are members of the zooplankton that serve as the basis for the macroscopic aquatic food web. Now, we might think of the krill as numerous, tiny little crustaceans that feed larger animals like whales, but the copepods are so tiny and so numerous that they serve as a food source for the krill. Also, a fun little fact, Sheldon J. Plankton, that emotionally nuanced antagonist of the SpongeBob SquarePants universe, is a copepod. Now, physiologically, they resemble some of the more later crustaceans that we discussed earlier, like the Cephalocarida and the Branchiopoda, with their thumb-shaped carapace housing a slimy, multi-legged body, antenna, and mandibles, with a segmented tail structure protruding in the back. Some of the more characteristic features of all or most of the copepods include myelinated neurons, which is really unusual for arthropods as well as the presence of a single, bright red compound eye protruding from the center of their head. The ten copepod orders include basal groups like the humble platycopioida, the calanoida with their long, fuzzy antenna, and the bloated, long-tailed mysophreoida. 
There's an intermediate group of longer, narrower copepods, like the cannuloida, and the enigmatic uh, gelioloida, with just two species that can be found in France and Switzerland. And there's the, uh, the fast-moving cyclopoida and the harpactosoida, which contains 3,000 species known for their short, stubby antenna. And lastly, a more derived group of strange, exotic-looking orders, such as the hairy Mormonaloida, the weird, creepy, and unusual Monstraloida, and the broad-headed Siphononastomatoida, which contains the vast majority of copepod fish parasites that are known for their siphon-like mandibles, where they suck out the body fluids and the juices of their host. Okay, now let's step back from the copepods and check out the last two subclasses before we get to the Malacostraca. These are the Thecostracans and the closely related and much smaller Tantulacarida. Both clades are represented by species that generally have reduced body forms that look like sacs or blobs or nodules. A small minority of these species are immobile filter feeders, but the vast majority of them are parasites. Let's look first at the Tantulacarida. This is a clade that includes 33 species across five families. You have the Onceroxonidae family with one genera, the Dorifalophoridae and the Microdagiidae family with uh, two genera each, the Diotertridae family with 11 genera, and the Basipodelidae family with seven genera, including the Stygotantulus. Now, I, I specify the Stygotantulus because it's particularly interesting. It contains just a single species, Stygotantulus stocki, which is arguably the smallest arthropod in the world. It parasitizes copepods. So I just want to point out the small scale of this little corner of the food web. You have krill, which are really tiny shrimp-like creatures, and they feed on copepods. And now you have these stygotantulus guys, which are even tinier, and they parasitize those copepods. Now, not to get too off track, but there are even bacteria and viruses that parasitize the stygotantulus. This is wild. It's increasingly tiny parasites all the way down. And then, of course, related to them, the, the bigger, more well-known group is the Thecostraca. This subclass contains over 1,300 parasitic species, divided into three infraclasses. One of the least diverse subclasses are the mysterious, shrimp-like Facetotecta, with a single family, a single genus, and just 11 species, which, as far as we can tell, only have a larval growth form and no mature adult form. Although, this is most likely because we just haven't found the adults. Although, it is possible that the larval growth form somehow reaches sexual maturity, and that's really as mature as they get. That is possible, but we just don't know for sure. Another Thecostraca infraclass is the Ascotheracida, which includes about 100 species of parasites. They parasitize nidarians, like jellyfish and corals, and echinoderms, like starfish. The third infraclass is the Cirripedia, better known as the barnacles. Barnacles are known as encrusters, as they temporarily attach themselves to a firm substrate, where they form a crust of sorts. Like other crustaceans, they have antennae and multiple limbs, but these are all wrapped up and hidden within a typically six-plated, heavily calcified shell casing that makes them look like little armored rocks. Once the mature barnacle has established itself in this protected, anchored position, they either passively filter feed, or they extract nutrients from a host. Among the barnacles, there are three superorders. The rhizocephala, which parasitize large ten-legged crustaceans like crabs by mounting onto their softer abdomen and then spreading fungal, mycelial-like feeding tendrils throughout their softer inner tissues with a focus on their digestive system. I'll talk about these guys in a lot more detail in a future episode, exploring the anatomy and the life cycle and uh, ecology of the crustaceans and stuff, but just make a mental note right now. The rhizocephala are absolutely disgusting. They are beyond gross. And when we get to this in this future episode, uh, when we cover their life cycle and how they, how they grow and reproduce, that is going to be a wild ride. 
It is just one of the nastiest things I think I've ever come across in the entire animal kingdom. It's so wild, it's so badass, and I can't wait to tell you about it later. But like I said, that's for a future episode. Anyway, the other two superorders of barnacles include the Acrothoracica, which includes 63 species known to burrow into the shells of corals and mollusks, and the Thoracica, which include the most recognizable barnacle species that you typically see embedded on coastal rock formations. All right, at long last, we come to the main attraction, which is one of the most important crustacean clades, the Malacostraca. This is, by far, the largest and most biodiverse class, with approximately 40,000 species divided across 16 orders. The Malacostracans have colonized both freshwater and saltwater biomes, and many species have also colonized coastal areas like beaches, tropical forests, and marsh or swampland. They've adapted to a wide range of feeding strategies, from filter feeding to scavenging to actively hunting carnivory. So without further ado, let's explore the 16 orders of the Malacostraca, which will take us all the way to the end of the episode. The most primitive Malacostracans belong to the order Leptostraca, which emerged sometime in the Cambrian period. They appear to be small, shrimp-like creatures, similar to all of the other primitive crustacean shrimp that we've discussed so far today. The clade has some 40 species, divided across three families. The Paranibaliidae, with five species, the Nibaliopsididae, with two species, and the Nibaliidae, the largest and most diverse family, with 33 species. The next most basal order is the Stomatopoda, or the Mantis shrimp, which includes over 450 species. These are significantly larger than the Leptostraca, and they have a more familiar crustacean body form, appearing like very tiny lobsters. They're perhaps most well known for having a pair of forelimbs that have evolved into highly developed melee weapons. Depending on the species, mantis shrimps have either club-like forelimbs with bladed edges that are used to smash, bludgeon, and brutally crush their prey, or they have barbed, spear-like forelimbs that can easily puncture, stab, and lacerate their prey. Either type of forearm is capable of striking at extreme speeds, accelerating at over 10,000 g, hitting the prey animal with a force of up to 1,500 newtons. This formidable offensive capacity allows mantis shrimp to hunt everything from snails and mollusks to crabs and larger fish. Now aside from these two basal clades, the rest of the Malacostracans exist in the subclass Eumalacostraca, which contains three superorders, Syncarida, Paracarida, and Eucarida. The simplest and least biodiverse of these are the Syncarida, which contains two orders, Anaspitacea and Bathanelacea. The Anaspitacea order contains four families and 11 genera of elongated shrimp-like creatures who live, depending on the species, in soils or in freshwater rivers and lakes of South America, Australia, and New Zealand. So they're basically a southern hemisphere clade. The Bathanelacea order, on the other hand, contains two families whose species are small and blind, but can be found almost everywhere around the world, except Antarctica and a few small islands in the Caribbean and the South Pacific. The next superorder is the Paracarida, which contains, depending on who you ask, somewhere between 9 and 11 orders. Paracarida is huge, containing many thousands of species of typically small, shrimp-like creatures. Their most distinguishing feature is a marsupial-like pouch on the upper part of their abdomen. It's fashioned with their legs or between their legs, like there's tissue that forms that connects some of their legs together. And this marsupial-like pouch is used to carry and protect their eggs. For the sake of brevity, I'll leave out the two disputed Paracarida orders and just briefly touch on the nine orders that are definitely not in dispute. These are, alphabetically, the Amphipoda, which includes approximately 9,950 species of small, narrow, shrimp-like creatures with no carapace. The Cumacea, or the hooded shrimp, which includes about 1,500 species of long-tailed, uh, narrow shrimp-like creatures that typically live in the mud and sand at the bottom of the sea, 
and the isopoda, which includes some 10,000 species that are roughly equally divided between aquatic and terrestrial. The isopods are highly varied. The Valvifera and the Acelata suborders, for example, comprise virtually all of the saltwater benthic isopods, and the latter make up a good portion of the freshwater isopods too, whereas the Anisidea suborder comprises most of the terrestrial woodlice species. There's a genus of scavenging benthic isopods called Bathynomus, or the giant isopods. The largest among them, the Bathynomus giganteus, can grow to be approximately 20 inches long. They're extremely creepy-looking multi-legged deep-sea monstrosities that are a product of the developmental phenomenon known as deep-sea gigantism. Continuing with our exploration of the Paracarida orders, we have the Lophogastrida, which includes 56 species of deep-water, shrimp-like animals with a carapace that extends far past the rear edge of their head to create a very characteristic crest. It's honestly not unlike what you would see in a Triceratops, or the Xenomorph from the 1979 James Cameron movie Alien. There's the Mictacea order, with four tiny, blind species lacking a carapace, the Mycida, or the opossum shrimps, which can be found in oceans and some bodies of freshwater across the world, and uh, they're also known to be sensitive to water pollution, making them effective biomonitors in the same way that moss and lichen can be used for air pollution. And then there's the enigmatic Speleographacea order, which also has four tiny shrimp-like species that live in caves and aquifers. There's the Tanidacea order, which includes about 940 species of small, long, narrow, shrimp-like critters that live mostly on the shallow water seafloor, and the Thermosbeniacea, which includes 34 species that live in the submerged caves of thermal hot springs. All right, and now we come to the final clade of the crustaceans, the superorder Eucarida, with its three constituent orders. Amphionidacea, Euphosiacea, and Decapoda. The Amphionidacea order is easily the smallest, with a single family, Amphionididae, and within that there's just a single genus, Amphionides, and within that there's just a single species, Amphionides reynadii. This single species can be found in tropical oceans, where it's part of the plankton community that feeds larger marine animals. The Euphosiacea order, also known as the krill, is a much larger clade, both in terms of biodiversity and just raw numbers. It contains some 10 genera with 85 species. The most diverse of these genera is Euphosia, and it's estimated that just one of these Euphosia species in particular, the Antarctic krill Euphosia superba, has a global biomass of approximately 379 million tons, which makes it the single species with the most biomass on all planet Earth. All of this krill biomass feeds a stupendous amount of larger animal life, from penguins to seals and whales to fish and cephalopods. And keep in mind that 379 million tons is just one species, when you're talking about all 85 species of krill that live throughout the world's oceans, you're talking about not just hundreds of millions of tons, but perhaps billions, if not tens of billions of tons of biomass. You can see why animals like this are part of the base of the food web. The final order of Eucarida is the Decapoda, or the Decapods, known for their ten jointed legs. Now, a lot of their close relatives, who are technically outside the clade Decapoda, also have ten legs, but these animals are a bit larger, a bit more sophisticated, and the clade itself just happened to be named after this feature. It's, it's a bit strange because, yeah, there's a lot of other crustaceans, especially cousins who are right next to them, who also have ten legs, but it is what it is. Decapoda is extremely biodiverse, containing some 15,000 species of shrimp, crab, and lobster. Within this massive clade, there are two superorders, the Dendrobranchiata and the Pleosiamata. The first of these, the Dendrobranchiata, is relatively small, 
It just has seven families and 540 species. It includes all of the crustaceans known as prawns. These include, among many others, the bioluminescent prawns of the uniquely named Lucifer and Beelzebub genera, the brown rock shrimp Cecionia brevirostris, known for its rock-hard carapace, the Paneidae family, which is famous for its myelinated interneurons that can propagate action potentials, or neural signals, at 210 meters per second, which is a faster conduction speed than any other animal species on the planet, and the Acetes japonicus, which is the singular prawn species most heavily farmed for food by humans. All right, now the second decapod superorder is the Pleocyamata, and with no risk of exaggeration, it's safe to say that it is huge and incredibly biodiverse, with 10 infraorders of shrimp, crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and more. The infraorders Caridea, Euposiobiidae, and Axiidae include a wide variety of small to medium-sized shrimp species, like the mud shrimp and the ghost shrimp. The infraorder Astacidea contains 782 species, characterized by a large set of claws on the first three pairs of limbs, the first pair of claws being exceptionally large and powerful. The Astacidea includes two superfamilies of crayfish, the Nephropoidea superfamily of true lobsters, and a monotypic family of reef lobsters in the genus Enoplomatopus. Similarly, there's the Polycolida infraorder, which are lobster-like crustaceans with four pairs of claws instead of just three, although their limbs and claws tend to be smaller and narrower than the true lobsters. And then there's the Stenopodidea infraorder, which includes more than 70 species that are somewhat lobster-like in appearance, except instead of their first appendage being large and equipped with claws, in the Cenopodidea, it's the third leg which is enlarged and equipped with claws. There's the Glyphiidea infraorder, which is an ancient clade that's mostly extinct, as the, the only living representatives of the infraorder are two species of spooky, long-legged, lobster-like creatures. And then you have the Jebiidea infraorder, which contains four families, including the thalassic mud lobsters found in mangrove swamps of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The Acolata infraorder contains two distinct families, such as the, the broad, heavy, Silaridae slipper lobsters with their thick carapace and unusual plate-like antenna, and the Palinuridae spiny lobsters, which have long, thick, fuzzy antenna. And unlike the true lobsters, they actually don't have claws, except, interestingly, the females have a small pair of claws on their, their fifth pair of legs. It's, it's kind of weird. Also kind of weird are the creatures of the Anomurans infraorder, which include, among others, the hermit crabs. Interestingly, none of these species that I've listed so far are actually true crabs. Instead, they've all undergone a kind of convergent evolution. What's happening here is an evolutionary process called carcinization, which means that these different lineages have independently developed a crab-like body form. However, in the true crabs, all ten of their legs are apparent upon quick visual inspection, but in these anomirans, the last pair of legs has shriveled down to a much reduced size, and they're tucked up inside the carapace, giving them the appearance of arachnids, only having eight limbs. The Anomurans infraorder contains seven superfamilies, such as the South American freshwater Agliidae family, the Yeti lobsters and others of the Chirostyloidea, which live in the, the deep sea around extreme temperature sites like cold seeps and hydrothermal vents, and the similarly long-limbed, but not closely related, Galatheoidea. These three superfamilies, Agliidae, Chirostyloidea, and Galatheoidea, all include the squat lobsters, which are lobster-like except for their lack of a tail, or the presence of a short stubby tail. Other superfamilies include the beach-dwelling mole crabs of the Hippoidea, the large, spiky, asymmetrical, cold-water-dwelling king crabs of the Lithodoidea, the bulky, slow-moving, hairy, stone crab Lomus herta, which is the only species of the only genus of the only family and the Lomasoidea superfamily, and then you have, in contrast, 
the 800 species of hermit crabs of the Pagyroidea superfamily, with their long, spiraling abdomens and their characteristic habit of migrating, hermit-like, into abandoned shells. And finally, we come to the last superfamily of the last infraorder of the decapods. This is the Brachiura, also known as the true crabs. They have ten limbs. The first pair ends in a set of claws or pincers, and the rest are used to engage in their characteristically strange sideways walking pattern. They have a tail, but it's tucked under the rear end of their carapace and hidden from view. And they have a thick, chitin-rich exoskeleton. Across the 850 species of crab, there is immense variety. The pea crab, for instance, has a leg span measured in millimeters, whereas the Japanese spider crab has a leg span reaching up to four meters wide. Some live in the oceans, others live in freshwater lakes and rivers, and a minority are known to live on land, in the warm and humid tropics. Among the ranks of the Brachiura, we have the 240 species of the basal Dromaeacea, the 46 species of the Renanoida, known for their protruding, unfolded abdomen that gives them a quasi-lobster-like shape, the 99 species of the Cyclodoropoida, and the thousands of diverse species of the Eubrachiura. This last clade, the Eubrachiura, has two major divisions, Heterotraumata and Thoracotraumata. Now, both of these two groups, these two major divisions of Eubrachiura, are far too big to explore exhaustively. But just to give you a glimpse, the heterotraumata include such creatures as the Majoidea spider crabs, the Erythria sinica tiger face crabs, and the Trapezioidea crabs, which live symbiotically with corals. The other group, the Thoracotraumata, is significantly smaller and less diverse, but no less interesting, as it includes clades such as the Cryptochiroidea, which also live in close association with corals the often brightly colored land-based Grapsoidea crabs, and the Pinotheroidea, which are small, soft-bodied crabs that live communally with various sea snails. All right, everyone, that is about it. That's your rundown of the crustacean family tree. And honestly, that was nuts. There is so much biodiversity here, and virtually every creature, be it a shrimp, a krill, a crab, a lobster, a tongue worm, or whatever else, they're all so creepy, so crusty, so freakishly monstrous, and also so integral and important to the world's ecosystems, to the world's food web. Now this may be the end of the episode, but our exploration of the protostome side of the animal kingdom is not over yet. The next episode, the final episode, will wrap up this series on the protostomes and this mini-series on the arthropods, by exploring the hexapods. You might know them better as the insects. And if you thought the biodiversity in this episode, if you thought the biodiversity of the crustaceans was incredible and almost overwhelming, then just prepare yourself because nothing, and I mean nothing in this world, is more biodiverse than the insects. If this sounds like something you wanna to listen to, then hit the subscribe button so you can get that episode right when I post it. If you enjoyed this episode, then hit that like button or give the show a five-star review. If you want to financially support the show, then check out the official store, or you can head over to our Patreon page and become a Patreon supporter at a tier of your choosing. The tiers on my Patreon page start as low as one or two dollars a month, and if I can put out about one show a month, well, that's about one or two dollars a show. Your financial support goes to pay for hosting fees and equipment for the podcast. And any kind of support you show, whether it's helping me out in the algorithm with likes and subscriptions, or buying something at the store, or becoming a Patreon supporter, anything you do is super appreciated. I can't even put into words how much I appreciate it. It means so much to me. And as always, thank you for listening.